This week marked the 23rd anniversary of 9-11, the catalyst for the U.S. invasion of Iraq. We live in a world where the reasons for that war remain opaque for many, as in 4.5 million people being killed in the region because of the lies of that war is just normalized. But there are reasons why this war happened, and it is very fitting to talk about them today. Because these reasons are not relics of the past, they are being replayed on the international scene right now. The same manipulation, fear-mongering, and behind-the-scenes influence that pushed the United States into Iraq are being used again, but with Lebanon, as well as Iran, now in the crosshairs, for very different reasons, mind you. Lebanon is an entirely different beast from Iran, but both are in the crosshairs of war. Every day, the Lebanese people go to sleep to the drums of war as headlines like these grow more ominous. Every day, the Lebanese people in the south are pounded with relentless bombs by Israel, and every day I am asked if a broader war for us in Lebanon is inevitable. The Israelis have marketed the self-defense narrative about them so successfully that we hear people in Lebanon say, you know, if you don't bother Israel, Israel won't bother you. I don't know what world they live in, but it certainly is not this one. So it's time to dismantle that illusion. So we will expose them. In this video, we will lay bare the forces that drove the United States to invade Iraq, a fascinating story that will give you chills. We will examine why that same playbook is being used again today. After you watch all my analyses, you can tell me what you think will happen. Understanding the past is critical for making sense of the current geopolitical tensions and for recognizing the signs before history repeats itself. So let's begin. The following harrowing tale of history contains data points that must be seared into your consciousness. Burn these data points into your eyeballs, and you'll begin to see not only the past laid bare, but also where the future might be heading. So answer me this. Why did the United States invade Iraq in 2003? Take a moment. I'm not asking about the stated reason. I'm asking about the real reason. To refresh everyone's memory, the stated reason for the invasion of Iraq was to eliminate Saddam Hussein's alleged stockpile of weapons of mass destruction, WMDs, which was proven to be a completely fabricated lie, as extensive searches post-invasion found no such weapons, revealing that intelligence had been fundamentally fabricated to the admission of those who fabricated it. So what was the real reason for the invasion? Was there a connection with 9-11? No. There were zero convinc convincing links between Saddam and bin Laden, the perpetrator of 9-11. Bin Laden and his associates were in Afghanistan and Pakistan, not in Iraq. Uh, in fact, Saddam and bin Laden were quite hostile to each, to, each, to each other. Saddam and Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. Was it to export democracy? For those who are too young to remember, by 2003, Iraq had been under the totalitarian rule of Saddam Hussein for nearly 24 years, since July 1979. Saddam Hussein's rise to power was actually facilitated by the 1963 CIA-supported coup in Iraq, which marked the ascent of the Ba'ath Party, the party that, uh, to which Saddam belonged, laying the groundwork for Saddam's eventual takeover in 1979. Saddam, yes, was a cruel dictator, and his regime maintained a firm grip on power through extensive surveillance and brutal repression to control dissent within the country. However, this was not unique to our world, as about 40% of countries in 2003 were ruled by similar autocratic regimes, almost 80 countries. So that's not a reason to invade. Furthermore, and perhaps more importantly, Saddam was the best friend of the United States in the 80s, particularly during the Iran-Iraq War, a period known as the tilt toward Iraq. At that time, Iraq was seen as a counterbalance to the revolutionary government of Iran, and the United States provided Iraq with intelligence, economic aid, and even dual-use technology that, they could be, that could be used both for civilian and military purposes. So no, the US couldn't give a damn about Iraq's dire human rights record. Was it for security reasons? It was widely known that Saddam's regime was notoriously incompetent. This meant he could not pose a real threat to the United States or its allies. In fact, Saddam's military suffered a devastating defeat during the 1991 Gulf War, 
Iraq was heavily impacted by 10 years of very severe UN sanctions that starved the Iraqi population. Iraq had no real military power. It was a paper army, strong on paper only. UN inspections had eradicated Iraq's nuclear program and Saddam himself destroyed his own biological and chemical weapons stockpile in a fascinating story that I will share another time. So no, that's not the reason. Finally, you might say it was a war for oil. For a long time, many have said that it was a war for oil or a means for corporations such as Halliburton to profit. However, there is scant evidence or scant direct evidence to substantiate these claims and ample evidence to, that calls them into question. In fact, oil companies as well as weapons manufacturers or even defense contractors like Kellogg, Brown and Root were making no noise about invading Iraq. So why was the U.S. so laser focused on invading Iraq after 9-11? Because of them. And this is your data. The war against Iraq would certainly not have taken place if it weren't for the lobbying efforts of Israel and its new conservative allies who orchestrated a campaign to push the U.S. into invasion. In the, spring of 19, of, in the spring of 2002, long before President Bush had decided to invade Iraq, the Israelis began portraying Iraq as a threat to, to the United States to justify U.S. action against Iraq as a preventative measure against another 9-11. However, their reasoning was baseless. And in a typical Zionist fashion, the Israelis invented the reasoning and peddled fabricated claims using intimidating tactics to pressure Bush into making a quick decision. How? They used a lie similar to the decapitated baby story and completely fabricated the claim that they, the Israelis, have gathered evidence that Iraq is speeding up efforts to produce biological and chemical weapons, hoping to link Saddam's Iraq to another 9-11. The most influential Israeli figures, from Prime Minister Ariel Sharon and every single former Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, Shimon Peres, and Ehud Barak, were at the forefront of this misinformation campaign. They continuously visited the United States to advocate for war. In public, they consistently flooded the airwaves of top U.S. press outlets and directly addressed Congress, and in private, they were working every rope available to the Israel lobby. Shimon Peres appeared on CNN multiple times and he stated we know that he Saddam is on his way to acquiring a nuclear option the Israeli Prime Minister's office Ariel Sharon was feeding uh, alarming reports that Saddam gave an order to Iraq's At Atomic Energy Commission last week to speed up its work and it was plastered all over the US news Sharon even pressured Vladimir Putin who was leading the charge for new inspections in Iraq to say that it was too late for inspections to be effective and they sent their very best pathological liar to address U.S. Congress. This guy. And if you take out Saddam, Saddam's regime, I guarantee you that it will have enormous positive reverberations on the region. And I think that people sitting right next door in Iran, young people, uh, and many others will say, the time of such regimes, of such just bots, is gone. There is a new age, something new is happening. No, I, I guess I was looking for a connection between September 11th and my understanding why we went to the Taliban is there was a connection there. They were harboring somebody that we believed did the act on September 11th. Yes, that's the first reason why right. you did it. Now it's you're going to take me from September 11th to Iraq somehow? Yes. There is no question whatsoever that Saddam is seeking and is working and is advancing towards the development of nuclear weapons. No question whatsoever. Saddam is hell-bent on uh, achieving uh, atomic bombs, uh, atomic capabilities as soon as he can. That same pathological liar was given the primary page to publish in the Wall Street Journal an article entitled The Case for Toppling Saddam. He also published in the Chicago Sun-Times, The U.S. Must Beat Saddam to the Punch. And another former Israeli Prime Minister, Ehud Barak, published an editorial in the New York Times entitled Taking Apart Iraq's Nuclear Threat. Can you imagine giving former leaders of a foreign country constant coverage so they can spew falsehoods in the U.S.'s prime media outlets? The extent to which these Israeli leaders manipulated the American media and political system 
continually spewing lies in prime outlets is outstanding and astounding. Never before has the U.S. allowed foreign leaders to dominate their media landscape so completely to push a war agenda. The result? The Israeli propaganda machine worked seamlessly in tandem with the neoconservatives in Washington to drag the United States into a war based on false premises. Indeed, the Israelis had their American lackeys working for them and their pro-war genocidal rhetoric around the clock. These people are known as the neocons or the neoconservatives, like Deputy Secretary of, of Defense Paul Wolfowitz, who was voted Man of the Year by the Jerusalem Post in 2003 for his role in advocating the Iraq War, Douglas Feith, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, who literally made shit up for a living, completely inventing links between Al-Qaeda and Iraq, all of which were totally debunked. Richard Pearl, who was a key member of the Defense Policy Board and falsely continuously asserted that Iraq was on the verge of developing nuclear weapons, a claim that has been thoroughly debunked by intelligence agencies post-invasion. There's also a former CIA director, James Woolsey, who was obsessed with proving Saddam was responsible for 9-11 by literally telling the most implausible made-up stories. Kenneth Edelman, Scooter Libby, Princeton historian Bernard Lewis, and the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., John Bolton, and of course, the journalists, quote-unquote journalists. I use the word between quotation marks because they are not journalists, they are propagandists, like Robert Kagan, or the Washington Post columnist Charles Crothammer, who received the Guardian of Zion Award from Bar Ilan University for crying out loud. William Crystal, William Sapphire, and many more. These are all Americans in official positions who betrayed the American people in order to advance the strategic goals of a foreign power. Israel, at the expense of American lives and resources. These neocons played an instrumental role as architects of the Iraq War. But it's crucial to note that despite their relentless lobbying, they could not convince either Clinton or Bush to fully back an invasion until 9-11 and Israel shifted the narrative dramatically. Israel's security was suddenly strategically tied to this agenda and that was the window of opportunity. Contrary to popular belief, Dick Cheney, then vice president under George W. Bush, who, don't get me wrong, is as big a war criminal as they get, but he was not the primary orchestrator behind the push for the Iraq war. In fact, throughout the 1990s, Cheney expressed caution about invading Iraq, arguing that such a move would lead to a quagmire and a significant strategic blunder. He even refrained from signing not one, but two pivotal letters sent by neoconservative groups to President Clinton in 1998, which called for military action to remove Saddam Hussein from power. He didn't sign them. Donald Rumsfeld was the only top-tier Bush admin official who favored war with Iraq, and he did sign those letters. Dick Cheney and Bush's primary foreign policy advisor in the campaign, who would become his Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, all initially maintained their position against direct military invasion in Iraq. And on April 3rd, 2002, the neocons published yet another open letter to President Bush explicitly linking the need for war with Saddam Hussein to the need to the security of Israel. And this created a clear pathway from the events of 9-11 to the eventual invasion of Iraq, with Israel's security interests deeply embedded in the U.S. war agenda. The letter begins by commending the president for his strong stance in support of the Israeli government as it engages in the present campaign to fight terrorism. It then argues that the United States and Israel share a common enemy and that Israel is fighting the same war. And then they conclude that Israel's victory is an important part of our victory. When Bush and Cheney started warming up to the idea and decided to seek UN Security Council authorization for war in September 2002, the Israelis got so angry as they thought that their plan would fail. To the extent that Shimon Peres famously questioned France's status as a permanent member of the Security Council because France was asking questions. And the coup de grace was, as usual, the Hitler card. Saddam was labeled as Hitler. And if the West did not stand up to Iraq, they would be making the same mistake they did with Nazi Germany in the 1930s. The United States was very sore from the pain of 9-11. They wanted blood. They wanted revenge. The Israelis, the Israel lobby, and the neocon lackeys maniacally manipulated that pain. 
They twisted the narrative so that anyone who opposed invading Iraq was labeled as an appeaser or a sympathizer with the Nazis. The Israelis were so forceful that in the fall of 2002, members of the Israel lobby, under the name The Israel Project, circulated a six-page memorandum to the pro-Israel leaders in the U.S. titled Talking About Iraq. As the war was starting to look too much like it was being fought for Israel, the memo urged public statements to be more demure, more mindful. Because you do not want Americans to believe that the war on Iraq is being waged to protect Israel rather than to protect America. Remember, remember how often I've said that the media creates fertile ground for war through false reporting? Well, the way the United States media manufactured the war through fake reporting against Iraq at the service of Israel was mind-boggling. The Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times played significant roles driving the war through their editorial pages. Retired generals and former Pentagon insiders were constantly on CNN and every major broadcast network, including ABC, CBS, uh, uh, NBC, PBS, making the case for war as a fait accompli. They were so incredibly hell-bent on an invasion that m even the most liberal amongst them, MSNBC, fired Phil Donahue and Jesse Ventura because of their skepticism about the war. Donahue had the highest rated show on the network, but he was let go just weeks before the invasion, reportedly because his anti-war views did not align with the pro-war atmosphere, and his dissenting voice might harm the network's image during a time of rising patriotism. The entire Israel lobby's efforts were so successful, along with the efforts of the neoconservative wing, that two weeks before the invasion, the networks had just one American out of 267 who questioned the war, according to fairness and accuracy in reporting. And on March 20th, 2003, the United States and the United Kingdom invaded Iraq. 20 days later, on April 9, Saddam was deposed. That's 20 days later. Eight months later, on December 13th, Saddam was captured. That's 268 days after the invasion. Three years later, almost one million Iraqis were estimated to have been killed on the upper margin. Read the Lancet report. Ten years later? Twenty years later? This war, which proved to be a stunning failure for both the US and the UK, devastated Iraq, the cradle of civilization, to such unbearable degrees that experts estimate it will take 10 generations for the nation to rebuild and recover even a fraction of its former stability and prosperity. This war morbidly destabilized the region. The ensuing chaos and lawlessness that resulted from this invasion unleashed a wave of sectarian violence so brutal, leading to some of the most gruesome massacres and the rise of some of the most sadistic terror, terror groups like ISIS that tortured and slaughtered indiscriminately, plunging Iraq into a prolonged nightmare of bloodshed and suffering, which bled into the entire region. The post 9-11 wars ended up leaving 4.5 million deaths in their wake. Want to hear the worst part? In the aftermath of the Iraq invasion and the subsequent discovery that there were no weapons of mass destruction, both the U.S. Senate Com Intelligence Committee and the Israeli Knesset published reports independently confirming that all of the intelligence provided by Israel to the Bush administration was false. $1.6 trillion U.S. dollars is the estimated amount that, the, that was spent by the United States from 2001 through 2021 on its post-9-11 wars. To give you an accurate idea, about how insane the number 1.6 trillion is, let me represent it for you in the form of time. One million minutes is almost two years. One billion minutes is nearly 2,000 years. And one trillion minutes is nearly two million years. That's how insanely large the number one trillion is. The Americans spent 1.6 trillion dollars, meaning if they disbursed one dollar per minute, they would need three million years to go through the total amount they spent on this war. 
They spent this exorbitant amount on the biggest blunder of their contemporary history to wreak havoc on a region based on false intel just for Israel. With $1.6 trillion, the United States could have provided free college education for every single American for the next 20 years, and they could have entirely eradicated student debt, which is crippling millions of young Americans to the point of never being homeowners, and still had enough to solve the homelessness crisis nationwide. But Israel first. Did anyone ever hold Israel accountable for the murderous lies that they spread? No. Did any of the media cover the pathological lies of Israel and the neocons? No, because the media is part of the axis of genocide. The American people are unaware of the harm that Israel caused and still causes them because their media, whose allegiance is towards Israel, are traitors, betraying the American people at every turn. Their allegiance is toward Israel, putting Americans in harm's way to serve the sick interests of a genocidal colonial power that exploits the American people's resources for their self-serving agenda. So to every single person who still clings to the dangerously asinine idea that Israel only attacks if you attack it, including some of my Lebanese compatriots, go to the kitchen, pour yourself a tall glass of cold water, and splash it on your face and strive for a more nuanced and accurate understanding of how the world around you works because our lives depend on it. The undeniable evidence demonstrates that Israel, as the settler colonial apartheid entity it is and always has been, can only subsist with perpetual war and chaos, and it actively cultivates conditions for it. This is not a subjective interpretation of the situation. This is an evidence-based analysis. Israel's survival strategy hinges on perpetuating a state of relentless violence, chaos, and instability, ensuring its neighbors remain weak, chaotic, and fragmented. By fostering an environment of perpetual conflict, Israel secures its dominance in the region, manipulating the turmoil to prevent the rise of strong unified adversaries. This calculated approach perpetuates a cycle of suffering and destruction in surrounding nations, enabling Israel to maintain its strategic advantage while systematically conducting oppression, stealing land, illegally extracting resources, occupying, terrorizing, ethnically cleansing indigenous populations. And by ensuring its neighbors remain in chaos, Israel creates the conditions to carry out these actions with impunity further entrenching its dominance and control in the region. And this approach serves to justify its horrific military incursions and expenditures, consolidate its encroaching territorial gains, and prevent the emergence of any strong unified neighbor by fostering conditions of war and chaos everywhere, not only in the region, but in the entire world, Israel covers up its criminality while systematically undermining the prospects for peace and justice. So far, the Israelis know that they are unbeatable in the Middle East. Why? How can they afford to continue this cycle? Because it's all for free, both financially free and accountability free. The United States pays for all its wars and covers up its war crimes. And as in the case of Iraq, the United States also wages the wars for them. But there is a caveat. Israel will wage their own wars when against an unarmed population, like in Gaza or in the West Bank, where they can easily commit genocide against a population where 50% are children and the rest are unarmed humans protected only by the flesh on their bones with not a shred of a protected human right in the world. Kill 100 Palestinian kids, walk away without a scratch and without a single question asked. It doesn't require skills, just psychopathy. They press buttons and explode defenseless trapped humans videotape themselves laughing while they do it and upload it on social media because they're such dumb criminals. But when there is real opposing threat, when they're facing an opposing military arsenal that might cost them soldiers, like in Lebanon, like in Iraq, like in Iran, they need to manipulate the United States to wage their wars. You know how people say Israelis fight in diapers? People are not kidding. They're not warriors. 
They're crazy settler colonialists, armed and protected by the United States, whose adversaries are totally unarmed and completely disenfranchised human beings. They have the most sophisticated and expensive arsenal in the world after the United States, but they use it to kill children. Israelis know how to persecute defenseless humans. That's their expertise. They don't know how to fight against a military arsenal. But war requires more than just free weapons that kill kids. It requires money, strategic know-how, manpower, and morale in order to break the soul of an adversary. Israel lacks all four for a serious conflict with Lebanon. Neither Kamala Harris nor Donald Trump is ready to bankroll their endless wars at the moment, and certainly not with manpower. As for the soul of an adversary to break, that's why Lebanon remains an unsolvable challenge for them. Lebanon is the biggest quagmire for Israel, where neither violence nor diplomacy has ever worked. And that's my talk for next time. Onwards and upwards.